Okay, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. Welcome, welcome, everyone. This, I think, is a first. We have both ASCA members and CSCAA members on our webinar today, and I want to welcome everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Lamont. I'm the CEO of ASCA, and I'm going to introduce in a second the Executive Director of the College Swim Coaches Association, Samantha Barani. And um, we are excited to be collaborating together on this. And hopefully it's the first of many uh, initiatives, programs, events that we collaborate on in the future. Uh, we both have, both organizations have the mission to support coaches. And so the more that we can do together, I think the better for the community. And that's what we, we both wanna do. So again, thank you for joining us today. Um, hopefully we'll be okay with, both Ariel and I from ASCA who are hosting this uh, this particular Zoom are in Florida. And so if there's, a, <laughs> if you if you hear thunder in the background, it's because we are um, luckily south of the hurricane, but we are getting some bands of weather, but um, we'll, I think we'll be fine. Um, uh, again, thank you for joining us. We have an amazing um, guest speaker today who is a well-known and respected attorney in the Title IX arena and is gonna share some really great information. I met him at the CSCA conference and was so impressed with the information that he was sharing. I, uh, Sam and I got together and said, we've got to get this to a broader audience as much as we can get this information out um, about how coaches and teams can take advantage of the law that's, that exists and that a lot of teams uh, don't take advantage of. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it on over to you, Sam, and you can go ahead and introduce Arthur as well. Hi, hi everybody. My name is Samantha Barney. I am with the College Swimming and Diving Coaches Association. So for those of you who don't know me, it's great to meet you and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. For those of you who don't know what the CSCA is or what we do, similar to ASCA, we are a coaches association where we focus primarily on college swimming and diving and and our mission is to protect, preserve, and expand college swimming and diving opportunities. And so there is, in my mind, not a more um, critical uh, set of information that we can learn and we can share than the law of Title IX and how it can um, provide opportunities where, they're, where they don't exist and um, serve people who are being underrepresented or not equally treated and also um, finding pathways to reinstatement when some a team is um, either vulnerable or already has been discontinued. So as Jennifer had said, Arthur was with us at our annual meetings and his message was extremely compelling and impressive. And the thing I, I maybe took away from it the most was that this is not a message we can only hear once. This is something we have to hear over and over again because every time we'll learn something new. I've had great conversations with, with Arthur and um, his work is incredibly impressive. And I hope that you'll, you'll see that as well. He has been twice named um, one of the top 100 most influential lawyers in America, which says a lot. And also he's um, successfully represented women in athletics more than any other, other lawyer. So um, if we're looking for ways to um, make sure that athletes are being treated the way they should be treated and opportunities are being offered where they should be offered, this is this is right where we should be starting. So Arthur, thank you for being here. Jennifer, I'm thrilled to be partnering with ASCA. And again, hopefully this is one of many places that we can um, leverage the power um, of our voices and, um, and, and make swimming a, a better place for for all of us. So without further ado, Arthur, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It is an absolute honor and a pleasure to speak to you all. Um, I think I wanna start actually by um, making sure everybody has my contact information uh, because I'm gonna download a whole lot of information to you. Um, and I'll end with the screen with it, but I also wanna start with it. So my email address, and uh, I apologize if somebody can put it in the chat, it would be great. I'm not good at the technology, but my email address is a Bryant, A-B-R-Y-A-N-T at baileyglasser.com, B-A-I-L-E-Y-G-L-A-S-S-E-R.com. And my cell is 510-507-9972. And I'm particularly honored um, to be 
asked to talk to you all today uh, because um, sort of reflecting my age, I have actually been doing Title IX litigation longer than anybody in this country, which is remarkable given that I'm only 32 years old. And um, I, I was the uh, lead trial counsel in the very first Title IX athletics case in the country. It was against Temple University in 1985. Uh, after three weeks of trial, Temple University agreed to settle and treat women and men equally in its athletic program. And just sort of, um, I should, I was told I should share my screen, so let me set this up a little bit. Um, so, can you now see the slide that says introduction and overview? Okay, great. Um, so let me just move this here, okay? Or let me try to move this here. Um, and I think I want to give you a little bit of my background to explain sort of why I'm here. Um, so I was a lead trial counsel in the very first case. Um, after that settled, basically, I got a call or the National Women's Law Center who asked me to try the Temple University case got a call whenever a school eliminated a woman's team. Because the truth is that most, almost every college and university in this country sadly, is in violation of Title IX, even though it's now been the law for 50 years, 51 years as of now. Um, but most young women or men don't go to college to sue their school, um, and they don't know their rights, and their coaches don't know the rights. And so they're sitting there in a discriminatory setting, but don't do anything about it unless the school does something to really infuriate them which typically was for years, eliminate the team. And then the school, the team goes looking for, what can we do to save ourselves? Uh, or the coach goes looking. And for year after year, I would get these contacts. And my routine was pretty simple. I would agree to represent the team. I would contact the school. I would say, look, don't make me see you. <laughs> You're trying to eliminate this team to save 50 or $100,000 a year. Um, if you put them back now and pay my legal fees, I go away, everybody's done, everybody's happy. But if you make me sue you, it will be a class action on behalf of all the women athletes and potential athletes at the school for all of the ways in which you're discriminating against women in your athletic program, which we both know is probably every aspect of your athletic program. It is going to cost you a fortune to treat women and men equally. It is going to be out in the public and visible to everyone. Under Title IX, you will not only have to pay your attorney's fees, but if we win, you'll have to pay our attorney's fees. Don't make me sue you, just do the right thing and put them back. And for year after year, that's what schools did. Until 1992, yeah, I'm that old, I'm sorry to say, um, or maybe I should be happy to say. Um, 1992, Brown University said, do you know who we are? And I said, yes, I know who you are, but do you know what the law is? And this is a federal law. Um, and we actually went, to, they said, we'll see you in court. So we actually went to court. Um, we, they were trying to eliminate, in that case, women's gymnastics and volleyball. We got a preliminary injunction from the court requiring Brown to continue those sports while we got ready for trial. They appealed to the Court of Appeals. This was the first big case in the country. The Court of Appeals ruled in our favor on every single legal issue. Um, we went back, got ready for trial. On the eve of trial, Temple agreed to treat women and men equally, but it still wanted to argue could it eliminate these two teams. And after the trial, the judge not only said they had to keep these two teams, but it had to upgrade from club status to varsity status several other women's teams. Again, Brown appealed. Again, the Court of Appeals ruled in our favor every single way on every single issue. This was now the cause celeb case in the country. Brown tried to go to the United States Supreme Court. They got briefs from colleges and universities all across the country, um, urging the US Supreme Court to take the case. And they said, look, if Brown, this Ivy League liberal school, if they're in violation of Title IX, then we're all in violation of Title IX. You need to take this case and change it. We said, yeah, they all are in violation of Title IX. It's federal law. You don't need to take this case. It's, the law is clear. The Supreme Court did not take the case. 
So after six years of litigation, um, Brown was held liable. We were told that, again, this is a long time ago, in 1998, the case ended. We were told uh, that they were spending more than $3 million a year more on the women's teams than they had before, that they paid their attorneys fees over $3 million. We know they paid us over a million dollars. And basically, effective 2000, oh, and I should say, Ms. Magazine named president of Brown University, the winner of its male chauvinist pig of the year award. <laughs> uh, so you can imagine about 2000, most schools stopped eliminating women's teams because they're sitting there in violation. They knew if they eliminated a woman's team, they were buying a lawsuit and they were going to lose the lawsuit. And so I went on building a national public interest law firm called Public Justice. Uh, it's at www.publicjustice.net. I spent 35 years there building it from literally me and the receptionists to 43 staff, 23 lawyers, from a handful of cases to the broadest range of cutting edge cases, consumer rights, workers' rights, civil rights, et cetera, all across the country of any organization. But in 2020, um, after 35 years there, I really wanted to get back to doing cutting edge litigation to help the public. But also my job had become go around the country, raise $8 million a year to support this now massive organization, bring in cutting edge cases, but don't get to work on them. So I joined a private law firm, Bailey Glasser. Um, it was a great law firm. They were great people. A key to it was Bailey was Ben Bailey who I had met my first week at Harvard Law School 40 years ago. And I called him up and I said, how about if I open you a West Coast office in Oakland, California? I don't know what I'm gonna do except cutting edge cases. And he said, great. And in June, 2020, I get a call out of nowhere from my former lead counsel in Providence, Rhode Island, who says, Arthur, you're never gonna believe this. Brown just violated our 22 year old settlement agreement. They've eliminated a bunch of teams. We have to get the band back together and go after them. So we did. Um, forced them to reinstate women's teams. Um, and COVID was hit. And I literally got a call for a month for the next eight months from schools that had eliminated either, I'm sorry, from athletes at schools that had either eliminated women's teams or men's teams in violation of Title IX. Eight months in a row, I threatened the schools like I used to um, and said, don't make me sue you. Eight months in a row, the schools agreed to settle without a lawsuit. It was that clear they were in violation. The difference is this time I say, not just put them back. You got to hire a Title IX expert that we approve of to do a full scale gender equity review to find out exactly where you're in violation of Title IX and to come up with a gender equity plan to get the school fully in compliance with Title IX within the next year or two. And that happened, like I said, at eight different schools in a row. And so only a few schools wanted you know, to actually go to court. So we are actually in litigation right now, only against three schools, everybody else has settled. We also, as part of it, we won the very first Title IX victory for men. That was at Clemson University, as well as the women there. Um, and. So we're now suing Fresno State University, San Diego State University, and the University of Central Oklahoma. And I should tell you that two weeks ago, uh, we threatened a lawsuit against Florida State University because its club lacrosse team should be a varsity lacrosse team. And we just threatened yesterday um, a lawsuit against the University of Oregon because they made their women's beach volleyball team a varsity team 10 years ago and have treated them like crap ever since, and have refused to upgrade from club status to varsity status their women rowing team. So um, as Sam mentioned, um, it was not what I ever expected, but I've actually successfully represented more women athletes and male athletes than uh, any lawyer in the country. And the reason uh, we've never lost one of these cases, and the reason we've never lost, um, and the reason I've been able to do this so long is sadly, that virtually every college and university in this country is in violation of Title IX, as are many public schools 
um, and private schools, but we can talk about that at the high school and junior high school, even elementary school level. Um, but with that introduction, let me talk to you. So here's the overview. Um, I was going to give you a why I'm here, and that's why I'm here. Um, I'm here because I'm dedicated to making sure that this law is enforced. You know, I grew up with three sisters. We all played sports together. My dad and mom played sports together. I was stunned. It seemed just so natural. Men and women, boys and girls, were just as interested in sports and should have a right to play sports and get support sports. But this has been the law for 50 years, and we're not even close yet. So I'm here because I want to make this law into reality. Um, the basic overview of what I want to do in this seminar is uh, explain to you what Title IX re requires and how you can use Title IX, um, including to get your team treated much more like the football team. So let me go ahead and move the thing. So here's what Title IX is. Title IX is a very simple law. It is an anti-discrimination civil rights law. It says, this is it. This is the entire substance of the law. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. That is it. Um, now, because it says any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, that effectively means every college and university in this country is covered because every college and university in this country is accepting at least a dollar of Pell Grants or something like that. If they're accepting any federal money at all, they're covered whether they're public or private. High schools, at least the public schools, are all receiving federal funds of some sort, and many private schools are covered um, as well. So that's what the statute is. Now, the statute to be clear, has made an enormous difference. It was passed 51 years ago. Many of you would have no reason to imagine this, but 51 years ago, there were all sorts of educational programs closed to women. Um, math, and math and science departments, graduate schools, teaching positions, absolutely closed to women. Some things were closed to men. Nursing schools were closed to men. All of that has gotten eliminated because of the passage of Title IX. The impact has been enormous. But where it's become most visible and has been most visible is sports. And the reason is because sports is the one aspect of education where there are separate programs for men and women. And the basic principle is not complicated at all. It is that there are separate programs for men and women. They need to be equal, period. So. When it comes to sports, the application of Title IX to sports um, is, is interpreted and enforced by the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. It basically says, and the regulations say, institutions must provide males and females with three things, equal participation opportunities, equal athletic financial aid, and equal treatment and benefits. To be clear, the team comparisons are relevant, and I'll go through this more in a few minutes, but the focus is program to program, entire men's program to the entire women's program. Now, let's talk about, I'm gonna, so I want to go through each of these categories individually. First, for equal participation opportunities, the Office for Civil Rights says there's a three-part test to determine whether you're offering equal opportunities or not. The first test is that the numbers, of, and if you qualify for any three, you're in compliance with the law. So the first test is the numbers of male and female athletes are substantially proportionate to their respective enrollments. Let me put that in plain English. <laughs> if 60% of the undergraduates are women, then 60% of the athletes should be women. If that's true, you're in compliance, you're offering equal opportunities, it's straight out proportionality. If you are proportional, um, then they say you're providing equal opportunities to the men and women. Now, remember, this statute was passed 51 years ago. When this policy was interpreted, which was in 1979, many colleges and universities didn't have very many sports for women. 
So the second part of this test that they said, even if you haven't reached proportionality, we're going to treat you as providing equal opportunities if you comply with the second part of the test. And that is that you have a history and continuing practice of expanding participation opportunities that responsive to the developing interests and abilities of the underrepresented sex. Now, to be clear, the underrepresented sex is almost always women, but not always. Um, at Vassar, the underrepresented sex was males. But basically, this principle says, look, if you haven't reached proportionality, but you have a history of adding women's teams as women's abilities and interest in athletics grow, um, then that's good enough. And to be clear, partly that came from an argument 51 years ago that women just didn't have the interest and ability in sports, so why should we give them proportionality? But 51 years later, if a school says they're meeting part two of the test and they haven't reached proportionality, it's very unlikely likely they meet part two of the test. Because if they had a continuing history of adding women's opportunities and teams, they'd be at proportionality right now absent some extraordinary circumstances. The third part of the test is, well, if you're not at proportionality, but you are fully and effectively accommodating the interests and abilities of all, in this case, the women, um, then that's good enough. And that makes perfect sense. If the school says, look, we're doing everything we can, it's not proportional, but we're offering all the teams for which interest, women have the interest and ability and competition available, then the Office for Civil Rights says that's good enough. And to be clear, there are some schools that qualify under the third part of the test. Not many, but there are some. For example, there's a science and technology school in the Midwest. The undergraduate enrollment is 75% males. And the truth is they don't have enough women even to field 25% um, of the opportunities to play sports um, at that college. That college is, I think, uh, fair to say, in compliance with part three of the test. They are not in proportion, but they meet there. Now, the reason I wanted to go through this in part um, is, to, is to get to the next point, which is that what happens when a school cuts um, a women's team? Well, let me go it this way. Question is, remember, part one says the numbers of male and female athletes are substantially proportionate to the respective enrollments. So imagine a school cuts a woman's team. It can no longer meet part two. The school has a, can't say it has a continuing history and continuing practice of expanding participation opportunities for women because it's contracting them. It cannot say it's fully and effectively accommodating the interests and abilities of the underrepresented sex because it's just eliminated one. So that means it has to comply uh, with part one of the test and say, well, we're offering substantially proportionate opportunities to men and women. And what that test means, and the Office for Civil Rights just filed a brief in the federal court saying this, is, is the gap between what the school is providing and what it would need to provide to achieve exact proportionality big enough to field a team for which interest, ability, and competition exist? The key question, is whether the number of opportunities required to fill that gap would be sufficient to sustain a viable team. That is a team for which there is a sufficient number of interest and able students and enough available competition to sustain an intercollegiate team. So to put a clear point on that, this means when a school eliminates a team, unless it is basically in proportionality, it's in violation of Title IX. Or if a school has a viable women's club team that could be added, unless it's already proportional, it's likely in violation of Title IX. Because there is a viable team there, the team they just eliminated or the team they're refusing to add, um, for which there is sufficient number of interest in able students and an available competition to sustain an intercollegiate team. So that's the basics on equal opportunities to participate. And I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. And this is true, to be clear, this equal opportunities part of the analysis applies for all schools at all levels, from colleges down to the 
even elementary schools that are covered by Title IX. The next report area does not. The second area is equal athletic financial aid. And obviously that only applies to colleges and universities that provide athletic financial aid. So it doesn't apply, for example, to the Ivy Leagues, which don't provide athletic financial aid. And there the test is really pretty simple. Um, I've laid out the actual language here. The school must provide reasonable opportunities for such awards for members of each sex in proportion to the number of students of each sex. Let me put it in plain English. It is a straight number crunch. If, for example, 60% of the athletes are women, they should be getting 60% plus or minus 1% of the athletic financial aid dollars awarded to athletes, period. That's the test. If it is less than 1%, now the reason it's not required to be exact is because the Office for Civil Rights realizes there could be non-discriminatory reasons for giving the men or the women not exactly a proportionate share. For example, if either more of the men or more of the women are out-of-state athletes um, and their tuition costs more, well, then that's not discriminating if you're not discriminating in recruiting <laughs> for one or the other. Um, and so what this Office for Civil Rights does is it basically says, uh, if you're less than 1% difference, we are gonna strongly presume that you're not discriminating. And if you're more than 1%, we are gonna presume, strongly presume you are discriminating. And that's the test, plain and simple. Um, in terms of athletic financial aid. The third area, and this really goes to the core of how to get treated more like football, and this is particularly for women's athletic, women's swimming and diving teams, is equal treatment. The third area is that all of the men, regardless of team in the athletic program, and all of the women, regardless of team in the athletic program, have to be treated equally. Now this creates, and, and there's a whole list of areas which are called, referred to as a laundry list of basically every area of treatment added together has to be equal. So you see the list here, everything from uniforms, equipment, supplies, to locker rooms, medical training, publicity, et cetera. All of this gets lumped together. Um, I shouldn't say lumped together because it's analyzed separately and then lumped together. And all of the men, regardless of team, are supposed to be treated equally to all of the women. Now, this is a fascinating sort of theoretical uh, area because in theory, it could be the men are treated better in uniforms, equipment, and supplies. The women are treated better in coaching support and housing and dining services and facilities, and it all washes out and it's all equal. Or in theory, it could be a hundred men, football team and the basketball team players are treated like gods. And all the rest of the men are treated like utter crap. And all the women are kind of treated in between. And it all balances out. In theory, that is all possible. But in reality, it's not like there that basically anywhere, at least in colleges. At almost all colleges, the men on the football and basketball teams are treated way better than all of the rest of the athletes, except for maybe the 15 women on the women's basketball team. And to be clear, the comparison is not sports, it's athletes. Um, so if a hundred men are being treated really well and the 15 women are being treated almost well, that's not equality, particularly then at almost every school, the way the rest of it is, is all of the rest of the men are treated at least as well as all of the rest of the women. And so as a result, at almost every school in the country, um, men as a whole are being treated way better than women as a whole, which means that almost every school in the country is in violation of this part of Title IX, which means that you all have a chance, and we can go to this in a little more detail in a minute, to go to your school and say, what's going on here? Um, 
you've got the men being treated as a whole way better than the women as a whole. Um, the women on my swimming and diving team deserve equal treatment. Um, and I want better equipment or supplies or scheduling or travel or per diem allowances, et cetera, for, for my team or for the women athletes as a whole or whatever the category is you want to focus on and say, this has to happen because the, pro, the school is required to treat the women and the men athletes equally, and it's not doing so. That's your biggest hook. Um, you have to look at your program and see where is the best thing to do this. Um, it will not generally work. It is true for the men at programs where men are being discriminated in favor of at your school right now. It could work if you're at a school where men, and there are some, I think, where men are being discriminated against. But what the way to get better treatment is to use the fact that Title IX requires equal treatment. And almost no school is treating people on the men, on the women on the women's teams anywhere near as well as the football players get treated. And almost no school is getting women, is treating women as a whole equally to men as a whole. So strategically, which areas you focus on, it's hard to say, but it's important for you all to know that. And when I said at the start um, that these cases had started, typically start where somebody, um, a school did something that really infuriated the women, like eliminate their team or refused to upgrade it. Um, I want to be clear that a growing development is cases over athletic financial aid, but even more so over equal treatment. So, for example, um, the University of Central Oklahoma, the school I said we were already in litigation was, the women's track and indoor track and field, outdoor track and field, and cross country teams, which made up 35% of the women's program, was literally given no locker room, no competitive facility, and required to practice at a local middle school. It's a stunning. And when we went to the school and they refused to fix it, we sued. Right now, against the University of Oregon, incredibly, they created a women's beach volleyball team um, about 10 years ago to try to move more to Title IX compliance. Turns out those women are the, get no athletic financial aid. They're a varsity team, no athletic financial aid, basically no locker rooms or facilities. They're required to go to a public bathroom where there are people using drugs and drunk in the bathroom, et cetera. Um, just horrible treatment, inferior uniforms. So that team is ready to sue. Treatment is becoming a new issue. And another issue is, that's becoming more and more is money. So I want to talk for a minute about Title IX and money and give you the bottom line on that. And I apologize for keeping glancing off to the right. It turns out when I show this screen, um, the screen is showing off to the right, and I'm looking to make sure I've got it covered. So Title IX and money, the bottom line. And this, I suspect, I, I find this is shocking to people, but it's true. Remember, this is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination. And as a result, money does not matter. Let me repeat that. Money doesn't matter. Whether teams or programs make or lose money doesn't matter. Whether teams are revenue producing doesn't matter. Where the money came from, whether it came from tuition, donors, ticket sales, et cetera, doesn't matter. And whether intercollegiate athletics are viewed as a business or not doesn't matter. Even businesses can't discriminate on the basis of sex or race. And the reason all of this doesn't matter is because schools can't discriminate to make money. Businesses can't either. Schools can't discriminate to avoid losing money. Now, I will say this whole discussion is fascinating because schools point to their football and basketball teams on the men's side and call them revenue producing sports. Brown University amazingly did that you know, 20, 30 years ago. And the judge was very clear. The judge issued a decision and said, first, this is a civil rights law. It requires equality. If you don't offer any athletic program, that's fine. You don't have to have an athletic program. 
And then you're not violating Title IX, you're treating men and women equally. You're giving both of them nothing. <laughs> but if you create an athletic program at whatever size you want, small, medium, large, what Title IX says, regardless of the money, you got to treat them equally. And you're calling football revenue producing. Let's be clear. Yeah, it brings in money, but it costs you way more money than it brings in. It is net revenue losing. It's like calling a company going bankrupt you know, revenue producing. Well, yeah, it's bringing money, just it's costing more. And so everybody understands, despite what you may think, all of the studies show over 95% of the football teams in this country at colleges lose money. And the average of the amount they lose is millions and millions of dollars. So don't buy the revenue producing argument. Most of these teams are not making money. But Title IX says even if they are making money, the school has to provide the bottom line here, equal opportunities, equal athletic financial aid, and equal treatment. Let me talk for a second to show you the difference that makes. So I started at public justice, moved on to Bailey Glasser in 2020, and I've been here since, so three and a half years. These are the schools that we have except for the three that we're suing right now, San Diego State University, University of Central Oklahoma, and Fresno State, every other school on this list changed its program to get into compliance of Title IX at the time um, in response to a threatened lawsuit. 80% of the cases we didn't have to even file. The school agreed to get into compliance. But sadly, the history of Title IX is the only thing that makes a difference is women or men being willing to stand up and fight. The federal government can enforce Title IX on its own, but in 51 years, it has never filed a lawsuit in court to enforce Title IX in athletics, which only underscores how important it is for you and your team, your team members, the women or men on the team, to stand up and fight. So let me talk about Title IX and athletics, where we stand now. First, almost all colleges and universities are in violation, um, and the enforcement is by litigation. Second, costs and attorney's fees are recoverable in these cases. The school has to pay your costs and attorney's fees. And so people understand um, my firm and most firms taking on Title IX cases in athletics don't charge a penny to represent the students um, in these cases because the school pays our attorney's fees when we win and we've never lost. And the fact that we're willing to take on the case and say, you don't have to pay us a penny, we'll get paid by the school should be pretty good evidence. There's a good case here or we wouldn't be taking it on. Third, COVID and financial pressures have prompted cutbacks by schools. But fourth, COVID and making or losing money are not valid defenses in Title IX. And way too many of these schools made the mistake of eliminating women's teams. I already walked through you. If you eliminate a women's team, you're violating the second part of the three-part test. You're violating the third part of the three-part test. And so unless you are have proportional representation, that is the num the percentage of the athletes, uh, percentage of women in your athletic program match or very close to the percentage of women in your undergraduate student body, you're in violation. And I follow the strategy I talked about. I go to the school and I say, don't make me sue you. Um, either you agree to get in compliance, put the teams back or upgrade the club team to varsity status or treat the women's teams like they should be treated. Um, Either you agree to do that and you agree to die, hire a gender equity specialist that we approve of, um, we're going to see you uh, and get, in, get in points, we're going to see you. And it has worked, like I said, over 80% of the time without a lawsuit. But let me explain as well that men's teams are covered too. So no one had ever successfully brought a case for Title IX for men until a couple of years ago. When Clemson eliminated its men's track, field, and cross-country teams, this was sort of an astonishing, I, I should tell you, in the middle of COVID, I got called repeatedly by schools eliminating men's teams. Now, often, often it wasn't a violation of Title IX, 
because the school was already discriminating in favor of men by giving men more opportunities to participate than they should have had. So cutting men's teams didn't violate Title IX. And if the school was discriminating against women, cutting men's and women's teams meant they were violating by eliminating women's teams, but they were not violating by eliminating the men's teams unless they were all proportional after the elimination of the teams. But I got approached by some men's teams that were cut. And one of my concerns was I didn't want to threaten over that, even if it violated Title IX, because I didn't want the school to say, oh, we'll make it equal. We'll cut a well, woman's team too. And so I was wary of, of course, I didn't want that result. But incredibly, Clemson was in an extraordinary situation. It cut 89 slots from its athletic program for men. Indoor track and field, outdoor track and field, and cross country. And the vast majority of those were African-American males. And they considered a race discrimination case, but the US Supreme Court has made it almost impossible to sue over race discrimination in this country. So after six months of beating their heads against the wall and trying to get the attention of the Clemson Board of Directors, they came to me and they said, we're thinking we might have a Title IX case here for the men, what do you think? And I took a look at the numbers and we devised a strategy no one had ever done before. On a Friday, I sent a letter um, to Clemson's president. I said, hi, I'm Arthur Bryant. I represent the men on the track, field, and cross-country teams. Um, your elimination of these teams, you were actually offering equal opportunities for men and women, proportional, before you cut these teams. But now you're actually discriminating against the male athletes uh, by depriving them of equal opportunities. And unless you put these teams back and agree to get in compliance, I'm going to file a class action on behalf of all the male athletes and potential athletes in the school for depriving them of equal opportunities to participate. And the following Monday, my co-counsel in my other cases, Lori Bullock, sent the president of Clemson University saying, hi, I represent the women on, at Clemson University on the, track, on the rowing team and on the track and field team. And we know about the men's threat lawsuit and we support that. We want you to comply with Title IX and you're depriving them of equal opportunities, but you're depriving the women of equal athletic financial aid and equal treatment. And unless you, pardon me, um, unless you put those teams, unless you give us equal athletic financial aid and equal treatment, we're gonna file a class action against you on behalf of all the women athletes and potential athletes at the school. So we literally made Clemson the first school in the country threatened simultaneously by the males and the females for sex discrimination in athletics and violation of Title IX. Um, and one thing that's important to note is the reason we had women from the rowing team and the track and field team, and the reason we were comfortable threatening Clemson is Clemson was already offering the minimum number of women's teams that could under NCAA rules. So we didn't worry, oh, Clemson will respond to this threat by cutting more opportunities. I'm very sorry. Um, I don't know how to silence this thing. We can't hear it, Arthur, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, pardon me. Um, so we weren't about that worried about them eliminating these women's teams. Um, but they could have tried to say, oh, we'll solve the problem of equal opportunity by just cutting women from the large women's teams. And the large women's teams were track and field and rowing. So by representing women on the track and field and rowing team, we also created the possibility for something else, which is that Title IX prohibits retaliation. And if all of a sudden they were to start cutting women from the teams on which the women threatening to sue them played, those women would have a retaliation claim. And the school understood that. And so it did not try to cut those teams. It literally came to us and said, look, given the numbers, if we have to put back men's indoor track and field and outdoor track and field and cross country teams, we're actually gonna be discriminating against them. That'll put us in discriminating against women in terms of opportunities. We're gonna have to add a women's team or two. And we said, so <laughs> go ahead. And they did. They added two more women's teams. They put back the men's teams. 
and they made women have equal opportunities. I'm sorry, but all have equal opportunities and got the women equal athletic financial aid and equal treatment. And one reason I go through all this to under show you the power of all this is that through these kind of activities, when William and Mary cut its women's and men's swimming teams, we threatened a lawsuit. William and Mary immediately agreed to put back women's swimming. And because they were putting back women's swimming, they agreed to put back men's swimming too. Similarly, when the East Carolina University cut uh, women's swimming and diving, and we threatened the Title IX suit, it immediately put it back, again, without a lawsuit. And when Dartmouth eliminated men's and women's swimming and diving, and we threatened a lawsuit, it put back not just women's swimming and diving, but men's swimming and diving, too. So with the power of Title IX to save both men's and women's swimming and diving teams has been demonstrated. We've proved it in the last few years, but everybody needs to know about it. But the much more important part is not just preserving the team, it's getting the teams the treatment, equal treatment they deserve. Um, let me, um, so I, I pulled- Arthur, pulled, we do have some uh, questions some in question. the chat. Just, just wanna make sure we leave time for that. We have about uh, 12 more minutes to go. All right, I'll try to rock and roll through here. So what I was gonna say is, Men's teams are covered now. Almost all women athletes and some men athletes could sue now where schools could comply with the law. Um, cutting edge issues. As you know, there's name, image, and likeness things going on. The clear rule here is if, if the school is at all involved in the NIL activities, Title IX applies because it's involved in educate, it prohibits an educational institution receiving federal funds from discriminating. If it's a private company and the school's not at all involved, Title IX doesn't apply. But if the school is involved, um, name, image, and likeness, and all those payments and all that treatment falls right into the equal treatment category and has to be equal as well. On transgender athletes, that is up in the air. The federal government has a new policy. We're gonna see where that plays out. And finally, on NCAA and conferences, um, the NCAA has taken the position that Title IX does not apply to it. So have conferences. We think it's dead wrong. We are looking for the right case to go after them. If any of you are facing an NCAA rule or a conference rule that discriminates against men or women, call us. We will help you challenge it. And then finally, right before we get to the uh, questions, um, what you can do. The first is educate yourself and your athletes. Um, Second, about what Title IX requires and um, how you can use it. Second is to advocate. Advocate in your school. Try to get things changed without threatening litigation. If the school is willing to do the right thing, that ends it. Third is organize. If, if your groups can organize to push for better treatment for swimming and diving, that makes a huge difference. And then finally, as coaches, as professors do at school, everything, what you have to do is activate and inspire your athletes. They are the ones with the rights. If it comes to court, they're the ones who have to stand up for themselves when we're talking about equal treatment um, or equal athletic financial aid and equal treatment uh, and athletic opportunities. So that's it, Jennifer. I've gotten to questions. I hope there's enough time left. Well, I can kick one off because I know I was DM'd one, um, if I can find it here. So if a school is investigating football facilities and my pool is breaking down, is that something we can bring up as a Title IX violation, even if the upgrades are happening with football donor money? Where the money is coming from doesn't matter at all. Um, once the money goes to the school, the school has a responsibility to provide equal treatment and benefits to the men as a whole and as a women as a whole. So um, yes, it should be investigated. Yes, if they're dumping millions and millions of dollars into the men's program and to not the women's program. Now to be clear, Title IX does not require equal dollar expenditures because there are some legitimate differences between men's sports and women's sports that are not discriminatory. If you give A plus uniforms to the football team and A plus uniforms to the women's volleyball team or other women's teams, the men's football team's uniforms are going to cost more. So Title IX doesn't say the expenditure amounts have to be equal. But if they're giving A-plus uniforms to the football team and C-minus uniforms to all the women's teams, you got discrimination. Um, and so 
Same thing with facilities. If they're providing, you know, millions and billions, incredible dollars for the football team and nothing similar, similar quality, not dollar amount, but similar quality of the women's teams, there's straight out violation. Perfect. I'll go ahead and read out the next one. Um, this is a two, two piece question. So what are the best methods to approach executive staff with concerns and also protect yourself as a coach from possible retaliation? There's second part. I'll let you answer the first part first. Okay. I want to be clear. I'm, I, I, I sort of feel like I have to do the screen. I'm not providing you legal advice about this. I'm giving you my general view. First is the best methods are openly and honestly to go to them and say, look, I mean, you can even say, I just intended this webinar. I've just learned about Title IX and I've got some concerns. Um, it appears this is happening and that isn't happening. And if people have questions, feel free to call me. I'm happy to talk more. It's why I gave the uh, information. It's why I'll put back up on the screen share. Um, I've got my, um, is my information up there now? It is not there. Oh, wait, give it a second. And... I see a blank PowerPoint. <laughs> That's not good. Okay. How about now? Hold on. I don't know how to do this. Zoom in you on the bottom there where it says the line by 10%. Yep. Just make that a little bit bigger. How about now? Okay. Okay. Second is the best way to protect yourself is to um, do it in writing, have your notes with you. Um, so you can show, first of all, the retaliation against you would be illegal. Um, but you don't want to get into a swearing contest of I said this and they said that, et cetera. The best thing to do is not that you have to do all the communications writing, but when you go in to see them, have notes. Um, so you can talk to them from the notes so you have some record of what you said and save those notes. And if they respond or you do it in writing, save. When you come out, you keep some notes of what was said. So you're creating a timeline of the interactions. If it's in writing, you save all the writing because how they respond in part is just going to come down to what the communications were and what their actions were. So the second part of that question is additionally, what about facility failures or arguments about competitiveness of a program as it relates to the elimination of certain female sport and addition of a new women's program? I'm not sure I understand the question. So if somebody... Yeah, is that, if, no, that's, that's, that's my but, fault. It was probably poorly worded, but I know in some situations, um, facility failures or competitiveness of, the, of a program has been blamed for eliminating a program, but then adding another women's sport to cover them. Is that is is there a cause for concern there, or, or something that can be litigated? It would depend more on the facts. So, for example. Um, Title IX does, it's only about discrimination in men versus women. Um, so for example, that's why the, the men's program, they can treat the football and basketball teams way better than all the rest of the men's teams and the men can't sue about it. It's not discrimination against women to discriminate against some men in favor of other men, right? The same is true on the women's side. If it's equal between the men and the women, which team the school has for the women or which teams doesn't matter for Title IX purposes. They could, I'm making this up, drop lacrosse and add you know, field hockey or vice versa. And if the numbers wash out and the school's in compliance, there's nothing under Title IX that lets you save it. I mean, there may be other things like money and politics and influence or other things um, that you could use, but Title IX won't if the women as a whole are being treated equally to the men as well. Is that answering your question? Okay. Other questions? I don't see anything else in the chat, but anybody yeah, else? Yeah, there is. Um, where can someone find their school's Title IX numbers? Okay. Oh, great question. Go on the web. EADA stands for Equity in Athletics Disclosure Act. Every school in the country, college and university, at least receiving federal funds, is required to file an EADA report to the federal government which then takes those that day, and it, it re, because it's about equity in athletics, it cuts breaks down by men and women at the school participation rates, athletic financial aid dollars, um, the coaches and their salaries by area, uh, sort of a whole lot of very useful information. 
It's not precise Title IX numbers, but it's very, very close. Um, and the federal government puts it all up on the web. If you go to put in, just put an EADA in your search, um, you'll get to the federal government where you can look at any individual school or groups of schools and pull up the data for the most current year and past years. Now, the problem is there's about a one year delay because they have to send it to the federal government and the federal government has to post it. So right now, like 21, 22 may be the most recent data um, for a school. Uh, but that's how you can get it. And many schools put their EADA reports on their own websites. Sometimes they're up there much faster than you can get them from the federal government website. So you wanna search for those two things. Often coaches as well have access to the reports come to the NCAA. And so you can look at the numbers. Those have all the information as well. And if anybody, again, if anybody has any trouble finding things or wants to know how to, don't hesitate to contact me. And there's one more question. Is this for higher ed only? No, it's for Title IX applies to all schools in the country that receive any educational institution that receives federal funds. So there are some private elementary and junior high school and high schools that are truly that truly don't take a federal dollar. And then it doesn't apply to them. But almost every public high school and many private public almost every public elementary school and middle school and high school and many private schools take some federal dollars and all of those are covered by Title IX. How might it apply in a high school situation then? Can you just give us an example? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you just give us an example for how it might apply in the, in the public school, high school sports sure. team situation? Sure. Sure, there's actually a case going on right now in Hawaii um, where the students have sued and basically said the women aren't getting equal opportunities to participate and aren't getting equal treatment compared to the men or the boys versus the girls. Um, and that case is getting ready for trial. Um, the courts have said, all right, they have the right to this equal opportunity. They have this right to the equal treatment. And if they're being deprived of it, we, Title IX says we've got to fix it. Oh, I, I wanted to just, if there's another question, I don't want to block that. Otherwise, I had one other thing to add. Go right ahead. That's that's the end of the question. Okay. The one thing that I was going to that I didn't mention was money. So up to now, um, all of the lawsuits that were brought were what lawyers call injunctive relief only. That is to a court saying, stop them from discriminating and make it right in the future. And we discovered schools care so much about money. Um, that we really thought we need to focus more on that. And so what we started to look at is, wait a minute, we got a situation where San Diego State University, it, um, and I'm gonna drop this, this stop share. Um, we discovered that San Diego State University uh, was cheating its women athletes out of $600,000 a year in equal athletic financial aid. Astonishing. Uh, and so we not only said, went to court and said, make them stop and make it right in the future, but we said, and give them the money. You're not allowed to keep the money from them, discriminate them, put it in your pocket when they should get it. And so the federal district court judge in San Diego, they literally, San Diego State come in and said, we can't be, they can't ask for super money. Nobody's ever done this before. To which we said, so what? <laughs> the law is the law. I've spent my entire legal career doing things nobody ever did before. The district court just said, oh yeah, you can sue for this as well. So we are now looking not only at suing for money, but also in terms of athletic financial aid, which is measurably dollar, dollar to dollar, and the money goes to the students, but other areas where this unequal treatment can be documented in a dollar way. So for example, if the women get a per diem when they travel, that's half of what the men get, well, then the women should get the money that they were cheated out of. Um, and that whole area is opening up and growing. And we hope and think that it will prompt schools more to say, we got to stop this. Because not only um, is it wrong, and not only is it a violation of Title IX, but it's going to cost us big time. Because so, for example, when they take women and give them $600,000 less than they should, and give women 600,000, give men $600,000 more than they should, 
and a lawsuit is brought, they're not able to take the money back from the men. So to put the women in the, in the position that the proportionally position they should have been put in, he has to give them $1.2 million to make it equal. Because uh, otherwise, the men come out ahead and the school's in violation. And we think as more schools realize they have to pay attention to this, they're going to be held accountable, more schools will stop the discrimination. Okay, on that note, we have reached the end of the hour, and that was a lot of information packed into an hour. So, Arthur, thank you so much. And also, thank you for putting your contact information out there and inviting folks to contact you. I think you're going to be an incredible resource for our members. And Sam, thank you for collaborating on this. Uh, I, I just think it's great information that we're able to share with folks, and I want to do more of it. Um, and by the way, uh, CSCA is providing a talk at the upcoming Rural Clinic next week on uh, high school recruiting. So if you're going to be out in Dallas, please uh, stop by that talk. Um, and if you're not signed up for Rural Clinic, it's not too late. Uh, it starts a week from today, actually. Uh, so anyway, yeah, let's wrap it up. And Sam, thanks again. If you want to have any uh, final words for us. Jennifer, Arthur, just thank you. This is this, the messaging on this is, is critical to the health of our sport. So even if you don't feel like it may apply to you today, um, make sure you, you have Arthur's information or reach out and we'll get it to you um, because it could be, it could apply later or it could be helpful to a colleague or an athlete that you know. And so um, again, I think this message is one we have to hear over and over and Arthur, thank you for the time and Jennifer, thank you for the collaboration. It's fantastic. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.